So we've been in this series on forgiveness, and our ushers are actually going to hand out a set of notes for you today as we continue the series. I've had quite a few of you come and talk to me just about how helpful this series has been for you personally. And I've been amazed as we've gone through this series just at how relevant this topic is to every one of our lives, my own life included. And I would really encourage you as we talk about this area of forgiveness to drill down you know, to, to, to go deeper into your own life, into your own walk, and not just think, oh, nice sermons, but God speak to me and impact my life. And we're in a kind of a progression in this series. We started with receiving forgiveness. We talked about how God forgives us and the absolute joy and freedom and relationship with God that comes out of that. And then last Sunday, second part of the series, Pastor Barry preached an awesome message about forgiving others. We said God forgives us, and then last week we said we have to forgive others. And how many of you last week had a a, a rock that you put down? How many of you put a rock down? Yeah, lots of you did that. You laid your rock down, your unforgiveness down. Uh, That was awesome. Well, this Sunday I actually brought a number of rocks with me, and I I got some in my pocket here that I want to just get out, and I'll I'll show them to you. Um, This particular rock... Uh, This is a rock that I picked up when I was just a little guy, so it's a number of years old. It's not millions of years old, like some of the scientists will tell you. It's just a few years old. But this rock, I I got, uh, I mouthed off my mom. And um, man, I I felt bad as soon as I did it, but not only that, my dad heard it, and he helped me feel even worse. (laughs) And uh, I always wish I wouldn't have done that. And, And so once in a while, I pull that rock out and just think about that and feel bad. Uh, my junior high years, this one is one that really hits me a little deeper, I guess, even than that one. I, in my junior high years, um, there was one kid in particular that I was very unkind to. I was a bit of a bully to this kid, and I'll never forget that. I sometimes pull that out. I see that kid's name, or I you know, see some update on his life, and I think, ah, I wish I, wish I wouldn't have done that. Uh, in my uh, senior high years, I had some really close friends, and I wasn't always the best friend I could have been. Sometimes I was selfish. I think about that sometimes. One particular friendship, I regret uh, not being a better friend um, to that guy. And then I got all kinds more. Actually, I got so many rocks here. Oh, man. I don't want to tell you about some of them. Some of them are pretty, uh, whew. But I got a lot of regrets and a lot of things that I uh, remember and wish, wish were different about my life. Some big ones, some little ones. Uh, I found a new one recently, actually. I, I told you I was driving home um, from dropping my son off at university in Calgary. He's 18 years old. And I, as I was driving back, I drove by myself back. And I had seven hours to think and contemplate and cry. And I was crying my way home. And I, I, uh, I miss uh, him, of course, and was just feeling all the emotion of your oldest son, whatever, all that stuff. But... Um, one of the thoughts that hit me as I was driving and, and thinking, why am I so sad? I, I realized I have regrets uh, as a dad. Um, yeah, I wish I, I wish I would have been a better parent than I was. And uh, I can't turn back the clock on that one. And I was really feeling the weight of that uh, on that particular day. And, and here's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about forgiveness, but in a different kind of direction. We're going to talk about forgiving ourselves forgiving ourselves. It's interesting that sometimes we can bring the stuff we do wrong to God and we can ask God for forgiveness and he readily forgives us. We can even bring it to other people and hear their forgiveness. But, but sometimes the residue of that guilt, the residue of that shame, it stays with us. And we can't seem to shake off the guilt or that sense of wrongness uh, even though uh, we have gone to God for forgiveness of it. And um, I, sometimes I, I call this phantom guilt or false guilt. Uh, it's a particular kind of guilt that uh, we really were never meant to live with. Um, uh, how many of you have heard of phantom pain? Anybody heard of that phantom pain? In fact, you can even have a phantom vibe. You know what a phantom vibe is? It's when you think your cell phone vibrated, but it didn't. <laughs> ah, that's a phantom vibe. You're like, oh, oh, somebody, oh, no, nothing. 
a phantom fly. Anyway, let's talk about phantom pain. Phantom pain is when a person is missing a limb or a part of their body, finger or limb, things like that, and yet they can still feel pain in that part of their body. And so it's gone, but they're still feeling pain. Their brain is still sending the signal that that part is hurting even though it's not there. It's not real pain, but it sure feels like pain. It feels just as real as the actual pain of, of that part of their body. And there's all kinds of things that doctors uh, can help us with and so on to, to help with that area. Well, the same is true when it comes to our guilt. Even though sometimes we've dealt with the guilt and the guilt is gone, we can still feel the pain of it. It's a phantom pain. It's still there. And we have to figure out what to do with that. And, and the truth is actually that guilt is a good thing. I mean, I realize that, but guilt isn't a bad thing. God actually made us with conscience so that we could feel guilt. Guilt is a gift because when we feel guilt, it, it calls us to do something about that. It invites us to repent, to find forgiveness, to change our ways, and so on, just like pain is a gift. I mean, it doesn't always feel like a gift, right? But pain is a gift. I mean, if we didn't feel pain, we'd just stick our hand on the stove and not do anything about it. But thank God for pain. It, 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 it causes us to move off of that stove. It causes us to move away from things in our lives that hurt us. It's actually good for us that we've felt those things. And the same is with guilt. But the problem is we weren't meant to live in guilt. See, we weren't meant to live in the space where we carried that around with us. And I love how R.T. Kendall puts this. He says, if you and I can make the distinction in our minds between true guilt and deal with it and pseudo guilt and not be governed by it, we are well on our way to true peace and freedom. So we are supposed to feel guilt, but we're supposed to deal with that guilt as quickly as we feel it. We're to bring it to Christ to find that forgiveness. So what happens, though, when we don't do that? What happens when we live with guilt, or especially with false guilt, the residue of guilt just carrying around with us? What well, has some negative effects on our lives. Uh, the first thing is we become hard on ourselves. We're, we're always kind of beating ourselves up, always trying to pay for our past failures. Uh, we're, we're, we're trying to make atonement for the things that we regret or for our sins. In fact, A.W. Tozer, great preacher and writer, he says this, some people live in their perpetual penance of regret. The perpetual penance of regret. Perpetual just means continual. Penance means trying to pay for. Regret means things I wish I would have done different. So perpetual penance of regret. Continually trying to pay for the past that I wish was different. And sometimes we get stuck there and we just live there and it can cause us to, 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 to feel bad about ourselves. And if we're not careful, the longer we do that or the more we do that, we can almost get comfortable in that space, kind of feeling bad about ourselves, beating ourselves up, feeling guilty. We can almost like that space. You ever been in a space where you knew you should let something go emotionally, but you kind of wanted to keep it? Right? You knew you needed to let it go, but part of you was like, well, I kind of like my pain. It's weird, us human beings, how we are that way, but it almost feels good to feel bad sometimes. And certainly in, in Christianity and in religion in particular, this is a real problem. We can almost start to, 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 to think guilt is so good that we should just keep piling it on. In fact, some people call it just the church that guilt built. And that's people who just go around just kind of piling guilt on themselves and piling guilt on everybody else. And they just think that that's, you're more spiritual if you're more sort of saying, woe is me, I'm such a sinner. Oh, right? And we build churches like this. We get preachers who will just hammer us all day long, tell us how sinful we are. Give it to us. You guys want me to do that some Sunday? Just tell us we're a bunch of rotten sinners. And then afterwards we say, thanks, pastor. You sure gave it to us today. Oh, I just feel way worse. Thank you so much for that. Right? That's the church that guilt builds. And sometimes we build whole uh, uh, ways of, of thinking about God and, and, and religion that way. We think it's all about just kind of piling it on. Oh, of course, it's not the best thing. And, and what's interesting is when, when that starts to happen in our minds, not only are we hard on ourselves, we start to get hard on others too. Um, we tend to treat others the way we treat ourselves, and this certainly is affected here. And we, you see that in the Pharisees, in the Bible. Um, but uh, it, it's true too. And, and, and tragically today, many times Christ followers are characterized this way. I don't know that it's as true as sometimes maybe society characterizes Christ followers this way, but sometimes they're known as judgmental, 
right? Looking down on others. And, and, and certainly we can become like that when we live with this false sense of guilt or this continuous sense of guilt. We're hard on ourselves, we're hard on others. It also creates a spiritual insecurity in us. We're always afraid that God doesn't love us. We're always afraid that God is out to get us. God is out to punish us. You ever, you ever known somebody who, who, who was uh, so insecure they needed constant reassurance? Ever met somebody like that? Just tell me again, tell me again, tell me again. Of course, we ought to tell each other regularly that we love each other, that we accept each other, and so on. But sometimes people can put up a kind of wall there where they can't really receive it. They can't really hear it. You can say it, but they can't hear it because they've got some, some barriers up uh, and some insecurities up. I think really we, we just did a series on the book of First John, a 12 or 13 part series. We just worked verse by verse through the book of First John. I think that's one of the main reasons John wrote First John was to deal with spiritual insecurity. And John wanted, the, 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 the followers of Christ that he was writing to, he wanted them to know, God loves you. You can be secure in God's love for you. You can be secure in your salvation and in Christ's forgiveness of your sins. I love it at the beginning of 1 John where he says, uh, I'm writing this to you so you won't sin. But if you do sin, and you will, right, we have an advocate before our Father. You need to know this. Even before you, you fall, before you sin, you have an advocate. Remember this verse? If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You can have confidence of that. A little bit later in 1 John, he says, even if our hearts are condemning us, man, don't believe that. Believe God. And we're going to actually talk about that particular verse a little bit later on in the message today. And then later in 1 John, he says, you know what, perfect love, when you understand the perfect love of God, it casts out fear because fear has to do with punishment. So, uh, God invites us to come boldly to his throne of grace. And, and uh, certainly, that's a part of it. So, we become hard on ourselves, we become hard on others. It creates spiritual insecurity. It also makes us isolate ourselves. We isolate ourselves from God, but we tend to isolate ourselves from each other. Um, I don't know what p punishments your parents use, but uh, one of the more popular punishments these days is called time out. You guys ever, anybody ever been put in time out? Oh, or you ever put somebody in time out? Maybe more. Uh, yeah. So wh what's that? It's, it's saying, hey, you've been misbehaving. You need to go by yourself for a while. And sometimes we, we punish ourselves this way. We give ourselves kind of our own time out. And there's something about shame that causes us to isolate ourselves, to hide ourselves out. And then the last thing, it causes us to reject our blessings. We think to ourselves, well, I don't deserve this. We almost feel bad for any blessings that come our way. And again, sometimes we know people like this who, who are almost self-made martyrs. We try to bless them or we try to serve them, and they won't even take it, right? I don't deserve that. No, no, don't bless me. Don't be nice to me. I don't deserve your niceness. And of course, the message of the gospel is, of course you don't deserve it. That's the beauty of it, isn't it? That it's by grace. That's why we say thank you. If you deserved it, the blessings that come from God, the blessings in your life, if you deserve them, you don't even have to say thank you for them. You just take them. Right? You earned it. You get it. The whole message of grace is that we don't deserve it, and yet God loves to bless us. That's why the Bible says you and I can come boldly before the throne of grace. We can come boldly before the throne of grace to find help. We can invite God to bless us. We can invite God to pour his abundance upon every area of our lives. Why? Not because we deserve it. Not because we've earned it. The very opposite, because we don't deserve it. But God is a God who is rich in mercy, rich in grace, who in Christ has offered us the fullness of his kingdom. It's an awesome deal. So that's what, what false guilt does. It's what causes us to live in that. So why do we do that? Why do we do that to ourselves? Why do we live in, in the, the, the pain of past regrets and failures? And how do we lead ourselves out of that? How do we bring ourselves to the place where we are fully forgiving ourselves? It's interesting, over the last couple weeks, as I've been reflecting on this message, I realized that, that this is actually an, more of an issue in my life than maybe I, I have uh, given it uh, credence to. I, I think I battle with this more than I really realize. I can rehash my old decisions again and again and again. And, and I can find myself bringing up and, and feeling these regrets. And, in fact, the Bible talks about uh, the, this term. Jesus is actually describing hell, and he calls it gnashing of teeth. 
in one place. And you know what that actually means? It means going like this. Oh, oh, oh. Sometimes I think of that when I think of my past. I just gnash my teeth. Oh, oh, right? I don't know if anybody else, anybody else do that? Yeah. And I, I find myself kind of going over some of my decisions and so on that way. So what do we do with that? Well, um, what I did for this message is I just wrote down four things that I do personally. Four things that I use in order to battle this false sense of guilt or this sense of continual guilt, living in guilt, in my own life. And I hope that this serves you well. So I'm going to offer you four things. Um, here they are. The first one is this. Recognize my enemy. Recognize my enemy. Know that what, the way my enemy works. The Bible actually says that we as followers of Christ need to be aware of Satan's schemes. We're not unaware of the strategies, the schemes, the, the methods that the enemy uses to get at our lives. So what are those methods? I mean, what, what are the schemes of the enemy when it comes to attacking us? Well, in Revelation chapter 12, there's this great little passage where it talks about how followers of Jesus overcome the evil one. And it mentions how they overcome. They overcome by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, testifying about the blood of the Lamb, right? And by loving not their lives even unto death. They're just going for it. They're laying down their lives for Christ. So they, they overcome by those things. But what's interesting is just before it mentions how they overcome the enemy, it describes the enemy. And it calls him the accuser of the brethren. That one who accuses uh, children of God day and night before the throne of God. In fact, the word Satan in Hebrew can sometimes be translated accuser. It's one of the main strategies that the enemy has in our lives is to accuse us, to say, you're a bad person. You did a bad thing. You're, you, you know, shame on you. And sometimes it's hard for us to discern, you know, is this just my conscience letting me know that I'm guilty and that I need forgiveness? Or is this the voice of the enemy kind of crushing me down, breaking me down? And what we need to do is develop a kind of discernment. That when we have brought our issues before God, when we have confessed our sins before God, when we have brought them before the blood of Christ, we need to remind ourselves, hey, if this has been paid for, then me trying to pay for it again by feeling bad or by any other thing is not honoring the payment that has already been made. And you see, the voice of the enemy will say to us, shame on you, shame on you, shame on you. You know what the voice of God says in the gospel in Jesus? Shame off you. Shame off you. You're released from guilt. You're released from shame in Jesus. And a real huge part of spiritual warfare in our lives, of resisting the enemy, is doing just exactly this. Taking the voice of the enemy, the thoughts of the enemy, and replacing them with the thoughts of God. There's a lot of discussion about what it means to fight spiritually, to do spiritual warfare. I believe spiritual warfare happens primarily in the mind, the battlefield of the mind, sometimes it's called. I love the way it's described in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. It says, the weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. That sounds pretty cool. God has given us spiritual weapons that will demolish the strongholds of the enemy, that will demolish spiritual strongholds of demonic forces. Wow. And so you think, well, what is that? What's a spiritual stronghold? What's a demonic stronghold? Like, are there castles in the spirit realm where the Satan lives or something? You know, what does that mean? Well, he goes on to describe it. What it means to demolish a stronghold. We demolish arguments. And every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And how do we do that? We take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. You see, the way we fight the enemy in our lives is we take the thoughts that he brings our way, the thoughts that are not biblical, that are not scriptural, that are not right, and we replace them with the word of God. That's how Jesus fought the enemy. Remember this? When Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, what did the enemy do? He brought thoughts his way. Hey, you should do this. Hey, you should do that. Hey, you should do that. You should think this. And what did Jesus do? He says, no way. Here's what the Lord has said. This is what the word of the Lord says. He fought the enemy with the word of God, and that's exactly what we need to do. We need to take those thoughts, those attacks, recognize them for what they are, and then replace them with the Word of God. And over time, those strongholds of the wrong thinking get turned around, 
to become the right way to think. One person said it this way, the next time the devil reminds you of your past, you just remind him of his future. Not sure if that's exactly the point, but it's a good little reminder. So recognize my enemy. The second thing I can do to uh, get rid of false guilt or, or that lingering guilt in our lives is I can learn to lead my feelings. You know, feelings are interesting things. Every human being deals with them, and they're powerful. Feelings are, are, are incredibly um, powerful in how they guide our lives and impact our lives. And yet feelings cannot be trusted. Please hear me on this. Feelings can't be trusted. Feelings, they come and they go. I mean, in one second you can feel like you hate somebody, and the next second you can feel like you love them, right? Feelings come and go depending on how much sleep we've had. True? Our, our feelings can be dependent on our blood sugar, right? What we're eating or not eating. Try eating like a whole bunch of pizza and then see what your feelings tell you, right? I mean, your feelings go all over the place. And they, they're dependent on so many things. And yet somehow we're tempted to believe our feelings, to trust our feelings. That's why I love this verse in 1 John. Even if we feel guilty, or our hearts condemn us, the way the uh, New Living, or NIV puts it, God is greater than our feelings, and he knows everything. You know what John is saying here? If your feelings are saying one thing, and God is saying something else, guess which one is telling the truth, right? Guess which one is lying, and which one is telling the truth. When your feelings say one thing, and God says something else, believe God, and don't believe your feelings, because your feelings are incredibly deceptive, and are often wrong. They're often wrong. There's a great passage of scripture in Philippians chapter 4 that has been so instructive in my own life and really so impactful in my family's life. It's been one of the main verses I've used as I've raised my kids in following Christ because we all deal with emotion and we all deal with how to battle our feelings and how to kind of train our feelings in the right direction. I love the way Philippians puts it. Do not be anxious about anything. That's a feeling. Anxiety, stress, worry, fear. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. So here's here's what the scripture says here. You can lead your feelings. So when you start to feel anxiety or fear or, or, or stress, those things, what do you do? Bring those feelings straight to God. Bring your issues, bring your life, bring the stuff going on in your world, bring it to God. And then I love that, with thanksgiving. How many of you know, when you start thanking God for things, Something changes on the inside of you, right? You, you, you start listing those things out, one, two, three, four, five. I have a little prayer pattern that I sometimes follow. It's called the Acts prayer pattern. It goes adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. Whenever I get to the thanksgiving part, I always think, oh, yeah, this will be easy. You know, I'll just thank God for a few things. No big deal. And I start naming the things that I'm thankful to God for in my life. And I'm always amazed at how it shifts my whole perspective. It shifts my way of thinking. It shifts the emotions that are going on inside me. So so he says, uh, do that. Bring bring your request to God. Use thanksgiving. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. It's awesome. And then he gives one more instruction. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Think about such things. I think of this as like an eightfold grid, like a filter, an eightfold filter for the thoughts that come into my mind. And if thoughts come into my mind and they're not good or pure or or, or praiseworthy or admirable, then I just go, oh, oh, that doesn't that, doesn't, that, that needs to be one that's filtered out. See, we can't really control what thoughts come into our mind, but we can control the ones that stay there. And, and what Philippians 4 says is you can choose this. And of course, what you think on tends to lead our feelings in a given direction. And this is the way I wrote it this week. It's in your notes. I must b- behave myself into feeling rather than feel myself into behaving. I must let my thoughts guide my feelings rather than letting my feelings guide my thoughts. I must make my choices and invite my feelings to follow rather than letting my feelings dictate my choices. Man, we can learn to do this. We can learn to guide our feelings 
This is such an important part of Christian faith, too. Sometimes we, we struggle with this. We think, why don't I feel God more? I wish I could feel God the way some people talk about feeling God. And, you know, we compare our feelings with other Christian feelings. And, and there's all kinds of battles and confusion that goes on in that. I've even met people who refuse to put their faith in Jesus because they couldn't feel God. What, what does the Bible say about that? Well, the Bible says we live by faith, not by feeling, right? That, that we, we, we know the truth, not because we feel like the truth is true. Can you imagine that? you imagine if we lived by feeling when it came to our, our walk with God? Man, we'd be Christians one minute, non-Christians the next minute, then Christians the next minute, then like atheists the next minute. Then we'd be, you know, we'd be all over the place because your feelings are all over the place. No, you walk by faith. And then you invite your feelings to follow. And it's amazing over time, in various situations, not every time, but it's amazing how your feelings catch up when you just say, here's the direction I'm walking Here's the thoughts I'm going to be thinking. Here's the choices I'm going to be making. Here's the truth that I'm going to be believing. And feelings, whether you feel like it or not, don't really matter to me because this is the right way. And, and, and um, the beautiful thing again is that feelings can and do catch up. Okay, so uh, how do I... Uh, forgive myself. How do I deal with that? I recognize the enemy. I lead my feelings. The third thing is I lean on my friends. Can't tell you how many times as a follower of Jesus I've needed a trusted brother, a trusted friend that I could open up my heart to and expose the burden that I was carrying in my own heart. And there's something so freeing when you can find somebody who you can trust, who's not going to like gossip about you or not going to go oh, I can't believe you thought that thought you know you and start whacking you over the head or something or beating you up right but there's something so freeing and I think God made us this way in fact James 5 16 says it like this therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective now, when you confess your sins to God, are they forgiven? Absolutely. But there's a sense in which that residue, that feeling of shame and so on, can be dealt with in community well. And I think God gave us community to help us with that. And there's something about looking somebody in the eye and saying, here's how I failed, here's what I've done, and having them look back at you and say, hey, we're all imperfect. Isn't that what God's grace is for? Isn't that what the cross is for? Aren't you glad that God is a forgiving God? Something so powerful and so freeing and so wonderful about that. And church, we all need to experience that. In a, in a bigger sense, we need the church like we are gathered here today. I think it's one of the reasons God called His church to receive communion, not in isolation, but as, as a body. Because as we're receiving communion together, what are we doing? We're proclaiming to each other. The blood of Christ covers sin. It washes it away as far as east is from west. Isn't this amazing? We're proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. We're reminding each other. We're singing songs. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I'm a child of God. And as we sing those corporately, there's something about being around each other that reminds us and encourages us and lifts us and just lets us know with each other, hey, this is true. God is a forgiving God. And you can experience and, and, and engage that. And so leaning on each other is a powerful thing. Now, one more thought about this, and I really wrestled with where to put this in the sermon. I feel like here is a good spot. Sometimes when we're battling thoughts, especially anxieties or self-condemning thoughts, sometimes the root of those thoughts is not so much spiritual or emotional. Sometimes the root of those thoughts is an actual physical ailment. It's called mental illness. And, and sometimes it's because there are actual chemical things going wrong in our physical bodies where we are unable to uh, change or adjust or work on our thoughts or our emotions. Now, in those times, the, one of the difficult things about that is that because we're struggling with it, sometimes we're unaware of it. And that's where loving friends can come in so powerfully. Because loving friends can sometimes come and tell us, hey, I think where you're at right now, what you need isn't for me to argue with you. <laughs> what you need is for me to encourage you to see a doctor. Does that make sense? 
And, and so it, as loving friends, we need to do this for each other. We need to at times say, hey, you know what? I, I think this issue goes beyond the spiritual or emotional. I think this issue may be physical. It would be worth your while checking with a medical doctor and, and just seeing if this is that kind of issue. And we would be wise, church, to listen to loving friends. Now, if, if you've got somebody who's mad at you and yelling at you and then says, you need to see a doctor, you know, you have my permission to ignore that, okay? But if it's somebody who loves you and cares about you, then this is an issue. And, and it needs to be dealt with just like any other medical issue. And I have seen, I, I've watched it with my own eyes, God heal people through wonderful, uh, gifted physicians and uh, their use of medicine. So uh, that, I think it's important to state and, and worthwhile, okay? So how do I bring this to myself? How do I bring forgiveness and get this guilt and, and put these rocks down? I recognize the voice of the enemy who says, shame on you, and I replace that with the voice of God that says, shame off you. Uh, I lead my own feelings. I don't let my feelings dictate me. When my feelings say something that contradicts the word of God, I say, you know what? It's my feelings that are lying, not the word of God. And I'm going to choose my thoughts and choose my actions, choose my behaviors, choose uh, my attitudes, and I'll let my feelings catch up to them. And then I'm going to lean on my friends. I'm going to bring my life before trusted friends, live an open life, expose things where I'm feeling shame or feeling guilt, and allow friends to care for me. And then here's the last one. Run to my Savior. Run to my Savior. And, and what I mean by this is, when we do fall, when we do fail, let's be people who are quick to repent, quick to bring our issues before God. It, it's something so valuable about deciding ahead of time that when you sin, when you do blow it, that rather than isolating, rather than hiding, you're going to bring that sin, bring that blowing it straight to the cross. The quicker, the better. Right? The sooner we bring it there, the better. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Man, there's something wonderful about keeping short accounts with God and just saying, every time I blow it, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to come before God. I'm not going to keep my guilt for long. I'm going to let my guilt lead me to repentance quickly. I love how Proverbs 24 says this. The godly may trip seven times, but they will get up again. But one disaster is enough to overthrow the wicked. Why is one disaster enough to overthrow the wicked? Because they stay down, right? It's no different. The disaster's not different. It's just that they don't get back up. They just, ah, oh, my life is terrible. I'm terrible. Everything's terrible. I'm just going to lie here. Oh. And I love what it says. The godly trips up. Seven times. He tripped up more than the wicked person did. In fact, you know that seven times? His seven is the number of completion. This guy is a complete klutz. That's what he is. Right? Just trips and trips and trips and trips. And here's the key. He gets back up one more time than he falls. That's it. He just knows. I don't know how many times I'm going to trip. I don't know how many times I'm going to fall. But one thing I know, I'm going to get back up one more time. One more time. You know, sometimes I think the areas that we deal with the most guilt and the most shame aren't necessarily the big rock things in our lives. Sometimes they are. But sometimes it's the things that we, 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 we put down, we say, I'm forgiven, and then somehow we find ourselves doing them again. And then we say, oh, I want to change that. I'm going to change. God, I'll never do that again. We put it down. God, forgive me. And then somehow we find ourselves there again, and then again, and then again, and then again. And finally we start thinking to ourselves, I wouldn't forgive me. How can he forgive me? And the Bible's real clear on this, church. God's grace is greater than our sin. Yes, we are great sinners. But God is greater. He's greater. His grace is greater. And he can come again and again and again and forgive us. One more thought on that verse. Notice that this righteous person, he doesn't just, uh, uh, you know, kind of confess his sins. He gets back up. The implication is he's, he's continuing his journey. He's continuing on. One of the things we need to be careful to do in our running to the Savior, coming to the cross, finding forgiveness, is we need to follow through on our confession of sin with something called repentance. That is, to walk it out to live differently, to, to say, God, not only do I need your forgiveness, I need your strength today to walk a fresh direction and a new direction in my life. 
And sometimes we carry around the shame of things because we know we're not changing. We're not doing anything different. Or if we are, it's very surface. You know, sometimes we can just bring our sins before God. Say, God, I just confess my sins to you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. And wander off. Uh, how many of you have ever dealt with dandelions in your yard? Anybody? Ooh, lots, yeah. I have. I got dandelions sometimes in my yard quite a bit. And, uh, you know, there's different ways of dealing with dandelions, but my favorite way is called the mower. You ever do that? <laughs> All these dandelions are everywhere. And you just think, ah, I could, you know, I could go dig those out, but I think I'll just mow them. And it's awesome. Ten minutes, every one of them's gone. It's beautiful. Sort of, right? My neighbor doesn't think so. Just saying. Because what happens? They just grow right back. Sometimes we deal with our sins kind of superficially like that. And it'd be wise of us at times to go a little deeper and just say, hey, I want to try to root this thing out by the grace of God and with the Spirit of God as I repent of this sin, as I confess it, as I find God's forgiveness afresh today. I want to root this thing out of my life. Now, not every time do all the roots come out. Sometimes we find that thing just springing back up again somehow, right? Crazy Danny Lyons. But the deal is, we're wise to not just superficially do this, but to go deeper and say, okay, Lord, why did I fall? How did I fall? What could change about this? What's the root of this? And how, God, are you working a new way in my life? The Apostle Paul has this great passage of Scripture in 1 Timothy. He says, even though I was a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Isn't that an awesome thing? Paul goes, I'm the worst of sinners, but as bad as my sin is, my God is greater. His grace is greater. And what was once a a source of shame and guilt for me is now a trophy of God's amazing grace. God's amazing, amazing grace. We live in a society that can be so consumed with self, don't we? It gets so self-absorbed. And you know, whether that self-absorption is about my goodness, you know, how awesome I am, my vanity. Did you know that we take, on average, seven selfies before we post one? (laughs) Whoa, right? So whether it's self-focused that way or whether it's self-focused the other way, condemning myself, beating myself up, the gift of the gospel is that it offers self-forgetfulness. It doesn't invite you to be vain about yourself or to be uh, 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 beating yourself up. It just invites you to forget about yourself and fall in love with Jesus. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Look to the Savior. R.T. Kendall says this, I will not let myself or another person or Satan keep me from honoring the blood of Christ shed on the cross for my sins. When God forgives sinners, he sets them free. It is his desire that they move beyond their failure, past their regrets. Man, it's a powerful thing and a wonderful thing when you and I realize, man, the blood of Christ has paid for this. It wouldn't be right of me to then go try to pay for it again. It's a done deal. And then to live differently, to live in the freedom and the joy. You know, when you forgive somebody, you don't want them wallowing around anymore. Oh, I'm so terrible. No, you're forgiven. It's Thanksgiving 2004. 19-year-old named Ryan Cushing was with five teenagers in a car. They were on a bit of a crime spree. They had stolen a credit card, gone shopping with it. They'd bought a bunch of things. One of the things they bought was a frozen turkey. They were driving down the highway in New York, and Ryan, for who knows why, decided to grab this frozen turkey and throw it out his window into oncoming traffic. Driving the other way was a woman named... Victoria Ruvolo, 45 years old. And this turkey went right into her windshield, right into her face, broke every single bone in her face, almost killed her on the spot. Um, She's rushed to hospital, barely saved, and then underwent a number of surgeries and all kinds of different things to help bring recovery into her life. A number of months later, Uh, Cushing was sentenced um, in court before a judge 
for this crime. But Victoria Rivolo asked to be there at the sentencing and asked if she could make a statement at that sentencing, which the judge allowed. Her statement included these words. There is no room for vengeance in my life, Ryan. And I do not believe a long, hard prison term would do you or me or society any good. I truly hope that by demonstrating compassion and leniency, I have encouraged you to seek an honorable life. If my generosity will help you mature into a responsible, honest man whose graciousness is a source of pride to your loved ones and your community, then I will be truly gratified and my suffering will not have been in vain. Ryan, prove me right. Prove me right. And Ryan broke down and wept. His jail sentence was reduced from what could have been 25 years to six months. And I don't know the whole story of how Ryan responded with his life. But I just think of those words on that screen. When God forgives sinners, he sets them free. It's his desire they move beyond their failure, past their regrets. You imagine if Ryan spent the rest of his life just moping around, living in regret, beating himself up, never really living, never really uh, reaching his potential. All that forgiveness would be in vain. And when I heard that story, I just thought, you know, it's a great lesson about us forgiving others. God's called us to forgive others the way he's forgiven us. But it's a great lesson about God's forgiveness of us and us learning to leave the past in the past. I love how Corey Ten Boom says it. She says, where Christ's blood has covered our sins, God puts up a sign that says no trespassing. And it's not our right to go back onto that land anymore to bring that back up any more. We're all imperfect people. We're messed up. People seeking and pursuing a perfect God. You know, that's our deal, right? No perfect people. I love how Dallas Willard says it. He says, don't think it's all the terrible sinners out there who need God's grace. It's the saints in the church who burn through God's grace like it's rocket fuel. Isn't that awesome? It's the saints in the church who need God's grace every single day of our lives. We don't have to get stuck in our past or in our guilt. We can come again and again to the foot of the cross. Let our consciences be cleansed afresh. Find that new freedom of life. And then, and then instead of wallowing, we can walk in the newness of life. Walk in the freedom that God offers every one of us.